the Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival. I am thrilled to be back again. I was here a couple years ago. And this year, my good friend Melissa Bourbon is here too. And we're going to get to chat for the next hour or so. So we're very excited about that. Very excited. I'm so happy to be here. I've wanted to do this festival for such a long time. And the funny thing about Melissa and I is that we actually knew each other back in Texas. We both lived there in North Texas a few years ago and knew each other from writer circles. And then she ended up moving to Colorado. I moved to North Carolina. And then um, we, I saw something on Facebook that she had posted about moving to this area. And so I got a Facebook message her and it turns out we live a mile and a half from each other now <laughs> in North Carolina. So I know, what are the odds? Yeah, very small world. And the town that we live in is really interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a very literary town. There's tons of authors here. And, and it, so it's kind of this, somehow it got this magnetic pulse that, that pull that pulls authors in. So the Bermuda Triangle for writers. <laughs> <laughs> So should I introduce you first, Melissa, since B comes before K? Sure. <laughs> sure. All right. So here, here's her official, official bio. Yeah. Melissa Bourbon is the national best-selling author of more than 20 mystery books, including the Book Magic Mysteries, the Lola Cruz Mysteries, a Magical Dressmaking Series, and the Breadshop Mysteries, written as Winnie Archer. She is a former middle school English teacher who gave up the classroom in order to live her imagination full time. Melissa lives in North Carolina with her educator husband, Carlos, and the youngest of their five children. She is beyond fortunate to be living the life of her dreams. Learn more about Melissa at her website, melissabourbon.com, or you can find her on Facebook at Melissa Bourbon slash Winnie Archer Books, and on Instagram at bookishly underscore cozy. Thank you. Add just a few things that I know about Melissa personally. <laughs> <laughs> she is an incredibly generous person, um, not only with readers, but with the author community. She's always setting up promotional things among authors where we can cross promote and get to know each other and network. She's host as a, hosts a book club in our town and has pulled people together, you know, that way. So, so she herself is kind of like a magnet too, pulling people together. So I just want to thank her for that. And and if you guys ever have a chance to get to meet her in person, make sure you take advantage of that because she's a wonderful person. <laughs> well, thank you. What a glow, <laughs> glowing uh, endorsement. I appreciate that. This is a nice email. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I have lots of great things to say about you too. Um, yeah, it was just such a fun coincidence that we both ended up so close to each other. We didn't even know each other that well in Dallas. Um, but I've been so grateful to have Diane as an instant friend <laughs> here in North Carolina. And um, okay, let me start by reading her bio. So I have it here. Diane Kelly writes stories that feature feisty female lead characters and their furry four-footed friends. Diane is the author of over 30 novels and novellas, including the Death and Taxes White Collar Crime series, the Paw Enforcement Canine series, and the House Slipper Cozy Mystery series. July 6th will mark the launch of her new Southern Homebrew Moonshine series, and she'll launch a second new series, she's very busy, the Mountain Lodge Mysteries in late October. Find Diane online at dianekelly.com, on Twitter and Instagram at Diane Kelly Books, and on Facebook at her author, Diane Kelly Page. And then we are both on Facebook. Um, if you search the groups for the Book Warriors, that is our online um, book club that we do. And uh, so <laughs> you said so many nice things about you. Let me, let me think. Um, I love so many things about <laughs> Diane. I have to narrow them down. One of the most special things about my friend Diane Kelly is her love of all things furry, which you can see from her surroundings right there. But in the real living furry things, um, she's got the biggest heart. And one of my questions later is actually about that. Um, but she just loves all living creatures and and it, it's just one of the best things about her. She's also very generous in spirit. And um, yeah, I think we're both fabulous and, <laughs> and everybody should want to meet us. <laughs> I feel extra fabulous today because I think for like the first time, well, one other time I've painted my nails during the entire pandemic, but I painted them today and they actually match my sweater. <laughs> very nice. I didn't really to have something to, to get excited about. This is wonderful. I'm so glad that we were invited to do this. And 
to get out yeah. of our pajamas and I know me too I have matching lipstick which I rarely wear and my glasses match my jacket so very yeah cute. very cute <laughs> we're both so cute <laughs> been pretty lazy during this pandemic so so this is this is nice so i've got my questions in a hat so we can like draw i can draw them out and kind of do them in a random order and we'll just okay. be surprised so should yeah. i ask or do you want to ask me first? yeah i'm gonna show my book you were so good about showing your books and i'm never good about this but i did bring them so i mean i have them i'm at my house so <laughs> uh this is pleading for mercy which is the first book in the magical dressmaking mystery series this was um, my first cozy mystery series. Then I have Needed to Death, which is the first book in the Bread Shop series. Then I have Living the Vita Lola, which was the first book in the Lola Cruz mystery series and was also my first book published. And then I have, so far, um, Murder in Devil's Cove and then The Secret on Run, Rum Runner's Lane. That's a tongue twister, Rum Runner's Lane. Uh, the first two books in the Book Magic mystery series. I did you intro you should introduce your books too i can personally vouch for how good all her books are because i've read a lot of them and um the ones that the devil's cove and the rum runners rum runners <laughs> <laughs> oh really I, I i keep telling her this they have this this incredible adventure element to them in addition to the mystery that kind of gives it this little extra is the word did i use that correctly in a sentence <laughs> <laughs> okay, these are my books. My first series is my Death and Taxes series that started IRS age and I did tax work before I became a writer. Um, creativity and taxes are not a good combination, so I figured I should stop doing one or the other, <laughs> so I decided <laughs> to stop doing taxes. Um, that was my first series, and there's 12 books in those series. It's wrapped up, so if you like to binge, that's a great series to binge. Uh, my next series is my Pawn Enforcement series, which is an all-female canine team set in Fort Worth, Texas. This is Bridget right here, the dog from the, the canine team. And that had a lot of fun with that one. That one's at nine books. Uh, my publisher has wrapped up that series. I'm debating about doing um, a follow-up novel or novella. There was a little, few loose ends I might want to tie up at some point, but that's- You definitely should. And you already have the title for it, right? What's the title? Uh, Pawfully Wedded. I love that, <laughs> Pawfully Wedded. It's, it's going to depend on my contracts. I got to make sure that I'm not in breach of my contracts by you know, releasing that. So uh, my third series, my house flipper series, this is the first of the series, Dead as a Door Knock, and it's set in Nashville, where I lived from uh, January of 2014 through June of 2016. Absolutely fell in love with Nashville. I left a little bit of my heart there. I know people say that San Francisco, you know, but I, I left some of my heart in Nashville. And when I do go back, it's, it's always kind of bittersweet. That was, it was just such a wonderful city. The people were very friendly. It was beautiful. It had a slower pace. It was just a very homey feeling place. And North Carolina is a lot like that too. I and think so, yeah. Um, independently published Busted series. And this is the first one in that series. And it stars a uh, female motorcycle cop. So uh, it's a series, but there's a different female motorcycle officer in each book. So they're just related by theme, not so much by character. And every single one of them, as your bio said, has fun, feisty women, which is the thing that I love most about your series because it it lets me be fun and feisty vicariously. <laughs> well, that's me do that when I write them too, because I'm really, you know, not nearly as um, wild and crazy as as these ladies are. I'd love to be, and I love to to be that on the page. But you know, sometimes in a life that could get you in trouble. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna jiggle up my hat here, my little leprechaun hat. And pick out a question for Melissa. Oh, we should say, though, Diane, first that we each wrote our own questions for each other and we didn't share, right? right. So <laughs> yeah. I hope you haven't stumped me. <laughs> These are surprises. Oh, this, this is what, what I thought was my funnest question. So this is fun that this is first. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I know personally that you love cooking um, and you have a great variety of specialized cooking appliances, like you have an espresso maker and you made me some really good espressos when we went on a writer's retreat. And then I ended up buying an espresso maker and my espressos don't take, taste nearly as good as yours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, you also have a pizza oven. You've got that beautiful kitchen that you remodel that is just like the dream kitchen with these huge islands. I would love to have that much counter space. Um, but if you had to use one of these kitchen tools in a murder, which one would you use and why? <laughs> okay. Your choices are. Oh, pizza. okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun one. Potato masher or cheese grater. <laughs> oh my God. Pizza with and why? Pizza cutter, potato masher, or cheese grater? In a murder in my 
in my books. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me think. Uh, I think I would go for an especially sharp pizza cutter and like cut the carotid artery or something. Yeah. Oh, how gruesome for a cozy mystery. <laughs> I was trying to tie in a good cookie. <laughs> yeah, well, you did a good job. Yeah. Ooh, now you've planted a seed. We'll have to see if that comes true in a book in some future bread shop book. Death by slice. Death by yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, I don't have any props, sadly, for my question. Now I feel underprepared. I have my questions in a box. This is um, my box where I keep my character notes. So notes on my characters from different series. So I don't have to always look things up. Okay. So Diane on the hot seat, your books have a lot of humor in them. I save all my humor for my books because I'm not very witty in real life. <laughs> in fact, um, y'all have to go to our YouTube channel and watch our video that we just did with Myrtle, the, <laughs> the Russian. You are hilarious in that. <laughs> well, so yeah, so my husband Carlos, I put it on, on our group chat for our kids and he's like uh, talking to the kids yesterday saying, have you listened to it? Have you listened to it? Your mom's never held an accent for that long. And so they're challenging me to do it at dinner last night and I, I couldn't do it. I'm just not that quick witted. Sophie and Caleb are just popping off when they're Russian accents with all this funny stuff. And I just can't do it live and in person. Um, so my wit is for my books, but you're very funny in real life. Um, so how, does humor in your books come easily? That's my question. Does humor in your books come easily to you? And how important is that component um, in your writing? It's funny because it, I would say it comes naturally, but not necessarily easily. And I don't know if, if I'll, I guess I'll explain that. So, so when I first started out writing, I didn't necessarily think, oh, I want to write funny books. It's just, it just naturally happened that way that I think I tend to uh, find the humor in situations. I'm a little bit sassy. I was the youngest of four kids. And if, you know, you kind of get forced to be a little sassy just to get any attention and to get noticed. So, so it came naturally, but when um, you're writing humor, it's actually kind of difficult. Like it takes me about five times longer to write a funny scene than a more serious scene because humor, um, especially on the page, um, you know, you've really got to get your timing right. And you don't control that when you're, um, when you're writing something, you don't control how a reader is going to read that. You know, if you're doing stand-up comedy on a stage, you can control the, the timing and have the comedic timing and all that. Uh -huh. So how you phrase things is really important. Um, the cadence, the punctuation, all of that kind of thing can be, be um, kind of difficult. And you want to make sure um, that when you're being funny, it's not necessarily at somebody's expense unless, you know, maybe they're a bad guy who deserves it. Future um, victim. Um, right, right. And um, you want to make sure that it's not going to offend somebody who doesn't deserve to be offended, um, you know, some of those kind of things. But um, but it did come naturally to me. I use humor in my own life as a coping mechanism. Um, that's kind of just something that I naturally do. And so uh, giving that trait to my characters kind of came naturally too. I'm not, I'm not a crier. I'm the kind of person that if something upsets me, I usually get angry. And when I'm angry, I'm funny. That, that if I'm in a really bad mood, that's when I can really write my funniest, which is Sounds odd, that's, but that's I just let it fly. <laughs> that's interesting. I'm totally a crier. I could cry at anything. And I hate that about myself that I have no control over that particular emotion. So humor does not come to me very easily. So the humor that I've added to books is only really in the Lola Cruz series, very maybe unintentional witty moments, <clears throat> excuse me, witty moments in the other books, but the Lola Cruz books are, are, I think, pretty funny and witty, but more, I would say, are the caper elements, the, the sort of slapstick, um, physical elements, and then some situational, you know, like just the weird little, um, uh, mini crimes that she's solving like in the first book you know there's there's this sort of Bonnie and Clyde couple that's robbing local stores and <laughs> and the woman you know like flashes the the checkers and she's got things on her <laughs> nipples and <laughs> so it's not that I have these funny witticisms it's like more like funny situations but you often will spot kind of spout off a a line that's so funny 
that from your book. So do you have a favorite line or a favorite, you know, conversation or something from any of your books that you can share? Um, one of my favorite ones was, was what I started. Um, where did I put it? Oh, it's under my computer. Uh, my death taxes and French manicure. And I think this is the line that actually sold me to my editor. And I start uh, out just, yeah, you know, I want to describe my character. I want to show that she's a little out there, but kind of funny. And I say that when she was nine years old, she formed a silly putty, you know what, for her Ken Barbie doll to make sure he could fulfill Barbie's needs. <laughs> because the Mattel, people at Mattel had given him a permanent state of dysfunction, right? <laughs> I was very proud of that line. I, I entered that book at a bunch of um, the Romance Writers of America chapter contests, writing contests before I got published and people always love the humor in that. So, so I'm proud of that line, especially because I think it sold me um, some other lines, you know, describing people. I describe her partner, Eddie Barden, as more LL Bean than LL Cool J. I liked the wordplay in there. I always kind of, when I come up with some kind of Great wordplay. I like that too. And what's the um, stun gun reference? That was always so funny to me. Oh. When um, she's going to like stun her partner or, oh gosh, it's in the pawn for it. I'm pretty sure it's in pawn enforcement. Yeah, it'll it'll come to me later. <laughs> later. Okay. All right. Maybe it'll come to me later too. But it's just, yeah, always strikes me yeah. as so funny because she like wants to stun this guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she, she, she did at the very beginning when he made her very mad. So, but okay. <laughs> job. so <laughs> not, not the best, best thing to do. So, okay. <laughs> Mike, you pull it out for you now. Okay. Since I know you personally, I know how productive you are and that you're always juggling lots of things, both career-wise and in your non-working world. She, she's amazing. She can do cooking and cleaning and art journaling and yoga and write her books and go play in the lake that's in her backyard and all this kind of stuff and <laughs> gardening and making pickles and, and all I'm doing is writing and, and making sure that my pets get fed <laughs> and walked occasionally. But anyway, so what's next for you both in your writing world and your personal world and what projects do you plan to tackle? Um, well, you made me feel so wonderful, so special, thank you. <laughs> I don't feel that productive most of the time. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So next in my writing world is the next book in this book magic mystery series. Um, so I've, I'm currently working on De Murder at Sea Captain's Inn. And this is a collaborative series with another writer, Wendy Lynn Watson. So we're, we write um, cousins who are both gifted with this gift of bibliomancy or curse, depending on how you look at it. And um, Pippin is on the East Coast on the Outer Banks and Cora, the character Wendy's writing and Pippin's cousin is on the West Coast. So the next book to come out is Death at Cape Misery in a, a couple months. And then after that will be a Murder at Sea Captain's Inn, <laughs> uh, which is actually, I'm, I'm not making that much progress on it because I'm so wrapped up in the, in the research because it has a lost colony of Roanoke historical element that I'm reading a lot about and just finding super fascinating. And so while I should be writing, I'm reading those books instead. <laughs> it is funny um, you can get sucked into things like that, but that's why we find our subjects interesting. I mean, that's why we write about those subjects is because it's subjects that we find interesting. Personally. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tie in history in, in a couple of my different books. Um, I have Harlow Cassidy, who's got an alternate, um, there's an alternate Butch Cassidy story there where Butch Cassidy has descendants and he makes a wish in this Argentinian fountain that kind of gifts his descent, the female descendants of his with this, um, kind, you know, sort of like blessed power, not really magic, but just sort of this ability to, um, to help the people around them. So that's an alternate history. And then there's a Bonnie and Clyde element in one of my books. So yeah, I like to tie in those history elements, which I'm having a lot of fun doing in this particular series. Um, and what's in our personal lives? Well, my son just got engaged. One of my sons, I have um, four boys and one girl. And so this is the smack in the middle boy um, who is who got engaged to his longtime girlfriend and we're just so so happy about that and excited about the upcoming wedding whenever you know we're able to do that um what else i have my daughter is uh transferring to a college over on this coast somewhere most likely so we're excited about that 
And my son, who's a senior, is has gotten accepted to UNC Asheville and Western Carolina and Eastern Carolina and um, just bunches of colleges. So it'll be fun to see where he ends up. And we're just going to be empty nesters for real here pretty soon. It's, it's fun. The first two weeks are hard that you'll be sad. And then all of a sudden you'll go, what am I sad about? This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I have friends who have scheduled vacations as they drop off, you know, right after they drop off their child to college to kind of combat that immediate feeling of the empty nest. Like there's that transition. So I'm thinking about that though, Carlos and I should go away or do something. I will say that that's one thing where I think having pets really helps because you know, that there's that nurturing part of us. And then all of a sudden, when we don't have something to nurture on a daily basis, you know, at least if you've got something furry to turn to, <laughs> kind of yes. that, you know? so they, they get a lot more attention once the, the kids are gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jared, the one that just got engaged, they've got two cats and they're like, we just love these cats so much. They're like our babies. And Carlos and I are like, yeah, we get it because now we have two little dogs um, and they're you know, they're cuddly and they sleep in our bed and they're our babies now too, because we don't have any little ones. So that's so true. Um, so this is a, well, okay. I'll wait till I get to the question. Um, okay. The Moonshine Shack Murder, which is the name of the first book in the Homebrew Moonshine series. Is that what it's called? The series? Southern Homebrew. Southern Homebrew. Okay. Um, it comes out soon. So I would like to know how you came up with this concept of moonshine, which is so unique. And I think if there's nothing else like it out there, um, you gave me a jar of moonshine, which I still need to crack open. I'm a little, I'm a little afraid. Like I need to have a whole day <laughs> to recover potentially. So I'm waiting for that. Just put a little shot in like some lemonade or cause it's the, it's the margarita one. Right. So it's yeah tea or something like that just a little bit of it can be can be good just as a nice little flavor and then that way it because <laughs> yeah we need, to go, we need to do another writer's retreat so we can just we do yeah. well, so how I got that idea was when we moved to Nashville um we would vacation sometimes this town called Gatlinburg that's up near the Smoky Mountains and they had this um place there the old Smoky Mountain Moonshine Company that makes moonshine and mason jars. And I was just kind of surprised by that because I thought, to me, I always thought moonshine was always something that was just homemade and I didn't know it was commercially made. I mean, technically it's just another name, you know, for whiskey, but, but the fact that they were calling it moonshine, putting it in jars, I just thought that was really cute and fascinating. And I also loved that they, they were smart. It wasn't just those that really high proof, high octane carburetor, right? Kind of moonshine. They realize, hey, there's a there's a whole female market that you know, or or people who are not heavy drinkers that might something like something that's lower proof and fruity and fun. So they made all kinds of fun flavors. They have you know apple pie moonshine. They have black blackberries, my favorite. They have cherry. They have um, lime. They have some that are um, creamy that you get. Like there was a butter pecan one. I mean, there's just all kinds of flavors, and there's several companies that make them. So I was just kind of fascinated by that, and then you know it, it started cropping up more and more. Like we'd go to the Loveless Cafe every time we had um, people come visit us in Nashville, and sometimes on our own too. And they had a moonshine drink there that I'd get that had blueberries floating in it, and I just loved all that. And um, so to me, you know. I, I'm not much of a cook, but I do like cocktails and I do like to kind of you know, mix things up and see, see what I can come up with. So I thought well, it would be fun to have, um, you know, a character who, who does that. And then with the 100th anniversary of Prohibition and all that came up, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And then, of course, moving to North Carolina and I found out, I hadn't known this before, but the whole um, car racing industry started from people running moonshine. And that's why it started in North Carolina. We have Charlotte Motor Speedway was because Junior Johnson out in Rhonda, North Carolina, which is actually not too far from here and on our way to the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, he was you know, a really good car racer and he started out running moonshine. And so they learned how to outrun the cops and all that. Then they started thinking, okay, driving these cars is fun. Let's, let's do something with this too, besides just moving the moonshine. So just all those things kind of came together um, and got me interested in writing about this and, and, and doing it from a female perspective, you know, where, um, you know, her moonshine is, is, you know, it's fun for her. It's fruity flavors. You know, she's opening the shop in Chattanooga and she makes it look kind of like a hillbilly shack. 
um, you know, with wood that's kind of crooked and things like that. So, so it's fun. And of course, she's got a cat and his name is Smokey after the Smoky Mountains outside of Chattanooga. And this is how I visualize Smokey right here. So <laughs> I always have these kind of things with me at, at book signings and events. People like to kind of visualize, you know, what the characters look like. So, so um, I like to get my little pet characters in there. So that's Smokey. And he's like, <laughs> He's, I had the pleasure of reading this book ahead of time, and I just have to say I love it. I think it's kind of like, um, well, it's like reading, you know, think when people ask you what's your favorite book, and it's usually the one that you're writing now, or that's the one you hate the most, one or the other. But I think it's the same, you know, reading your books, because I love all your books, and I love all your series, but, you know, each one that you put out, I'm like, oh, no, this is my favorite one. Oh, no, this is my favorite one. Oh, this is my favorite one. I, I think right now, The Moon Shack, Shine, moonshine shack murders that's a tongue twister too I think that's my favorite at the moment it's just so great and I love the characters I love the way you portray strong females so yeah I can't wait for it to come out I have I have a lot of fun with Hattie Hattie Hayes is the main character but her um granddaddy uh, he's kind of crazy and he's there helping her run the shop because he's the one who passed the recipe down from his, his father got arrested way back in prohibition and he's, you know, almost 90 now and, and he passed the recipe down to her. So he's around and then there's a hunky, good looking uh, mounted cop that has a horse named Charlotte, named after <laughs> Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, and his name's Marlon and he, he comes into the mix. So it's kind of fun, you know, adding some romance in there too. I, I enjoyed doing that. It kind of adds another element I think to the story and and makes it fun it does and and I have a moonshine element in this book too which I didn't mention um storybook charm because she's after or, or the, her neighbor Reed so it's her who's her um story is her name and it's a small Texas town and her neighbor Reed is trying to find this um secret moonshine recipe and yeah. so that's that, that's a type that's weird that we both have that sort of element <laughs> See, we're simpatico. <laughs> <laughs> my cat's rubbing on my ankles down here. My She's dog like, is snoring oh, down here. <laughs> okay, um, so you mentioned to me that you do various types of journaling. It's like, I know you do art journaling and you've talked about doing morning pages. So can you tell us a little bit about how journaling helps your creative process? Yeah, so uh, my mom and my brother are both uh, artists. My mother is a watercolorist and my brother is a painter um, and art professor. And um, I've always loved art, but it's not my, my go-to method for creativity. Um, but I enjoy doing it. And, um, and I think that for me, especially when I feel a little, um, I don't know, just stuck or overwhelmed with the books and the contracts that I have and I need a break but I still want to do something creative I turn to art so um, I joined an art journaling meetup here and I've made some great friends and it's once a month and we just get together and art journal and basically what that means is um, well you can do it any kind of way but so one way that we do it or that I do it is to you know write reflect whatever and then you kind of do some sort of art on top of that so that it, those words, whatever words you needed to get out, maybe are not fully exposed for anybody, you know, future great grandchildren to, <laughs> to find, I don't know. Um, or it's just, you know, doing art for art's sake because it taps into a different sort of creativity for me. So um, I'm teaching myself, my, my mom's a watercolor, so I'm teaching myself to to do watercolor, to paint in watercolor using this book. It's 365 um, days of watercolor, I think it's called. And so it just has little mini lessons and it's much harder than I thought it would be. So I have mad props for my mom and her watercolor skills because that's a tough medium. But anyway, I, yeah, I just do it for, I don't know, something different that's also creative that kind of takes my mind away from my books and laundry. <laughs> That is interesting because a lot of creative people and a lot of other, you know, writers I know do have some second creative hobby or something that they do like that. And it's kind of like, yeah, switching up the creativity or another form of expression. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes ideas, I think, come to us when we're doing something else, you know. Well, and for you, what, what would you say yours is because I know you garden and that's something that you enjoy and that's like a you're doing something and it's creative and, you know, mixing colors and, and then also tactile digging in the dirt. And is that a time that you process or a time that you just get away 
It is. Yeah. And actually just, just yesterday I went to the store and I, um, I was looking for mailing envelopes, but I came across, you know, those recycled or uh, de decomposable things to do little plants. And I bought a whole bunch. I was like, yay, I'm going to buy these. And, and I got some seeds. So I'm going to, I'm going to plant some stuff. But, but yeah, there's something about doing something that doesn't require your full concentration that I think kind of, you know, opens your mind. It's, it's almost like th things are kind of happening um, while you're letting your mind relax or, you know, uh, relax. So I find if I let my mind relax, that sometimes, you know, ideas will pop into my head. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've talked about this a little bit before. This is not one of my formal questions. Um, but so when I get stuck on a book, it's always because I know something is not right with something that one of the characters has done, or, you know, the plot is, is stalled because it's going in the wrong direction. Um, and so I often have to just put it all aside for a couple of days and then, you know, ponder it. And invariably the answer comes to me after a night of sleep. So, you know, it might be three or four days in, but I get, it's like my subconscious works on it and I get the answer mm -hmm. finally after, you know, a couple of days and it just pops into my head. So it solved the problem. Do you, is that something that happens for you too? It, it does. And, and that's why I always think it's funny when people go, but how many hours a day do you spend, you know, working on your writing? And it's like 24. <laughs> I mean, because right. if I'm not consciously working on my writing, I feel the same way that my subconscious is kind of, you know, back here processing, which I think is maybe why my memory is so bad right now. I feel like at any given point in time, 25% of my brain is working on my book, whether I'm aware of it or not, you know? Actually, but I, I think we're just in, going into menopause. <laughs> That's an unfortunate, <laughs> an unfortunate consequence of that is fading memory because I'm, I'm there too. Yeah. Sucks. yeah, I mean, sometimes, yeah, I just have to, I have to ponder things. A lot of good ideas come to me in the shower or when I'm driving. Hmm. Too, I find that just especially on like a long road trip where it's kind of mindless and the straighter the road and the less I need to be paying attention to traffic and if I'm out in the middle of nowhere ideas will fly like crazy so it's it's kind of just getting it's way those distractions of putting on blinders and um yeah just letting the mind kind of wander and see where it goes you know just talking it through too like I had I was having this issue with the previous book and and Carlos and I went for a hike and so I was telling him what my issue was like what was going on and what I was stumped and he didn't have any great insight for me but just the process of talking it out I provided the answer so I'm like oh I know what I have to do this is what I have to do and so you yeah. know I was able to move forward so talking it out really helps me too yeah I found that with other writers too because they'll they'll suggest you know a different way to, to approach the problem or something and they're like oh if I just kind of slight ask myself a slightly different question mm -hmm. phrase it a little bit different way it makes it more clear yeah. yeah I've actually lost track of who asked the last question. I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> um, okay. So I know you're a dog and a cat and all living creatures lover. Um, so much to the point that you do not have pest control. I have pest control because I, oh yeah. <laughs> he just jumped up on my table here with me. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to tell us all of your um, pet names here in a second. Uh, so uh, what, first of all, this is a multi-part question. So what are your pet names? What is the largest number of cats you've ever had at once? Cause I know, I know it's a lot. <laughs> and then how do these in animals, uh, who always play a part in your book, how do they influence your plot? Because for example, in the paw enforcement series, um, and actually in your, in your house slipper series too, you have, uh, your animals have a very interactive part of your plot. So, Let's talk about your animals, Diane. So the highest we ever had was when we lived in Nashville. We had eight cats and three dogs at the time. So it was just my husband and I in the house as far as humans. We were outnumbered five and a half to one non-human to human. I need to get you a shirt that says, I am really a cat lady. <laughs> And the way that happened, I, at that time, only two of those cats did we voluntarily seek out. Uh, the rest um, had been accumulated when we lived in Mansfield, Texas. There was a really bad stray and feral cat problem out where we are, where we lived there. And uh, my rule was, I will feed you, but I will get you fixed. And if you stick around, I might invite you in. So um, several cats ended up getting invited in and becoming part of our, our home from uh, that process. Um, so, and luckily they, they all got along. They, they did well um, together. So, but eventually, you know, people got 
but not people, the animals got old and some of them have, have passed away. So we're down to three now. We've got Winky, who's like 16 years old. She's a brown tabby. She's over there looking at her bowl right now saying, why is there nothing in my bowl that I have to eat? Because there's only dry food over there. And she's, she's just real sweet. She's been a very easy cat, um, affectionate on her terms, you know, kind of has her own personality. Then we've got Fritz here who's rubbing on my flowers. And um, I don't know, if, am I getting him in there? He, yeah. uh, we got him when we actually lived in Burleson right before we moved to North Carolina. Our um, neighbor knew we had other cats and one day her boys showed up and they said, our mom told us to bring you this kitten. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, did she now? So, <laughs> so apparently another neighbor had, had dumped this kitten on them and, and they had a, um, a boxer who did not like cats. So we've got Fritz still, <laughs> you know, he was welcome to join, join in the group. And then I also have Shakira, who's a calico. She's asleep down there on the, the ground right now. We, we um, got her because someone had dumped a litter of kittens on our street, um, again, in Mansfield. It's, we were kind of on the edge of town and, you know, people just are bad about taking pets I out. I think there was just a beacon above your house. <laughs> you know, a sucker. And, animals. <laughs> and at the time, my daughter was, she was only in eighth grade. She's four years out of college now, four and a half. But, um, they were going to, she was going to a student council meeting. My husband was driving her there um, and she called me from the cell phone and said, mom, there's a bunch of kittens. Someone dumped on the side of the road, go get them. And I was able to get two of them. And um, the other ones ran off. So I unfortunately couldn't get the whole litter, but, the, but they were like, Rumble and Shakira were best buddies for years. And then Rumble finally, he, he passed a couple of years ago, but so down to just three cats right now. And two of them are pretty old. Take a moment to just interrupt and say, oh, I don't know if you can see, you can't see. If you hear snoring, that's my pug Bean who's in his bed snoring. So just, just an alert. He's a sweet. And then we've got three dogs. Uh, Junior is a shepherd mix and he is incredibly stubborn. Bridget from my paw enforcement series is, um, uh, he put my books under my computer to prop it up. I need to stop doing that. So Bridget from my paw enforcement series is based a lot on Junior. He's he's very stubborn. He he wants to be the alpha even of the humans. He wants to be in charge. And um, but he's very smart too. So he can do helpful things. Um, like our dog Reggie, who's a Dalmatian mix, is deaf. And when we, we adopted uh, Junior and Reggie together from the shelter in Mansfield, and we'd had him a few weeks and Reggie was out in the backyard. It was dark at night. And, um, you know, you can't call a deaf dog to come in. And I was standing on the back patio waving my arms and she wouldn't turn around. I didn't want to walk into the yard in the dark and possibly, you know, step into a dog landmine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of jokingly just looked at Junior and I said, Junior, go get Reggie. And he looks at me like, what? What, what is that? So I said it again, Junior, go get Reggie. Next thing I know, he runs over there and gets her and brings her back. And I was like, that is a smart dog. So. <laughs> Awesome. I kind of put up with a lot of his, his, uh, you know, naughtiness because he, yeah, his shenanigans, because he will help with things like that. And then our third dog was kind of a finder's keepers. My son um, had worked for a photography studio and they had gone out and done a shoot and they were on their way home one night and it was after dark and this little terrier mix ran right in front of the car. They almost hit him and he was mostly black. So it was a good thing that they saw him. But um, no microchip, he wasn't neutered, he was covered in fleas, he had a flea collar on, but no regular collar. But we did everything we could to try to find the owners. We put um, flyers at all the animal shelters, you know, in a pretty wide radius. We put up signs, we put things on Pet Finder. If anyone had been making an effort at all to find that dog, they would have found him. So he ended up just sticking around and he's still here getting yeah. fatter by the day. <laughs> so, so I've kind of pulled on, you know, Reggie, Reggie is the destructive one. Um, she, she's a super chewer. So Bridget chews up a lot of things. I kind of borrowed that, um, you know, in the, in the pawn enforcement books, you know, about Bridget being destructive. So she's, so she's part junior, part Reggie, kind of a, a mix of those two. And uh, Reggie influenced Sailor, who's the rescue dog, stray dog that Pippin um, finds at the end of Murder in Devil's Cove. I guess that's kind of a little bit of a spoiler, but anyway, um, yeah, so Sailor is, is, deaf and that was completely inspired by Reggie and then also inspired by my friend Gwen's um beautiful Vishla mixed dog um Finn who's got the Finn Chronicles which is fun to follow so yeah Reggie has influenced my books too <laughs> well it's interesting having a deaf dog because you know even though I can't call her she's she's really probably our best communicator which you know may sound kind of ironic but she'll really look at your face to try to gauge your mood 
And, you know, after we'd had her a few weeks and I noticed that she was really looking at me, I kind of did a face just to see if she responded. I went like that. And she kind of cowered. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was just like trying to figure out if you were, you know, interpreting my face. And I realized she was. So she'll really look at you like that. And she'll, she's funny because she'll sit in front of the pantry if she wants a treat. You know, the other dogs might go over there and bark, but she'll sit there and then she'll just kind of cut her eyes to it like, hey, hey. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's kind oh, of a subtle, subtle way of, expressing herself you know she has nuances whereas the other dogs don't really have nuances you know tell uh tell about um Lindsay's TikTok oh. so in in uh November and December my daughter came out she lives in Los Angeles normally but she came out and we went we have a, a cabin up in the mountains in uh, North Carolina we went up there and stayed up there and we had Reggie with us and Reggie was sitting by the door and wanted out. And Lindsay is all about social media. She works in the ad um, business and, and she's the social media person for her, the accounts. So she knows how to do all that kind of stuff. And so she did a little video of Reggie at the door um, wanting out. And instead of just barking, you know, Reggie was doing her little subtle communication, you know, escalating, you know, starting out just kind of go bah, bah, to get our attention to let her out, you know. And I wasn't actually there at the time. Lindsay was, was filming this whole thing, but, but it ended up, um, this video, you know, Lindsay posted it to TikTok, TikTok, and then later that day she goes, this has had 300,000 views. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know? I was like, wow, our dog's getting famous. And then next thing she knew she had like, you know, 2 million views or something. A couple of companies got in touch with her, you know, about, you know, putting it on YouTube and, and getting paid advertising. And then the Dodo contacted her. So it's, it's on the Dodo now. So, you know, it's like, I've been working my butt off to try to become famous and <laughs> my dog beat me to it just by being cute. And, okay, and my, what's the dodo? <laughs> oh, so the Dodo is, it's a, a funny site that uh, features sweet animal stories. You know, they're always very uplifting and funny, but it's always something. And so the thing about the video is that she wrote, right? Um, Reggie, like, I forget what she wrote exactly, but basically Reggie doesn't know how to bark, but was trying to bark, right? <laughs> As yeah. a deaf dog, it was so yeah. sweet. Yeah. Not surprised it went viral. Yeah, and it was cute because they pointed out how Lindsay was using her, you know, talking to a dog voice in the video. Because, you know, you just do that. Like, I find myself still saying things to Reggie, even though she can't hear, just, you know, because that's how I'm used to communicating. So mm -hmm. sometimes on a walk, if she's sniffing, I'm like, okay, come on, let's go. And, you know, really, she doesn't hear what I say. She only feels a little tug, you know, but. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's a sweetie. Is it my turn? I think, is it my turn to ask you? Maybe, yeah. Maybe? Okay. Okay, your bread shop series is set in the fictional town of Santa Sofia, which you've mentioned is based somewhat on Santa Cruz, California. And your magical dressmaking series is set in the fictional town of Bliss, Texas. Your book magic, magic series is set in a fictional town on the Outer Banks called Devil's Cove. So what have you got against the real world? <laughs> and if you could live in any of these fictional places, which would it be and why? Huh. Well, my first um, series, The Lola Cruz Mysteries, was, is set in Sacramento. There are five books in that series, and it's set in Sacramento, and um, it, it was fine. It was fun, but you have to know an awful lot about a city or a place to, if you're going to use setting at all, um, you know, in order to make it authentic. And, you know, there's this one area of the Garden Highway that has the marina off of it. And there's part of this book that takes place at the marina. And, you know, I, I went there, I took notes, I took pictures, I wrote about it. And I still got a comment that that's not what the Garden Highway is like. And that's not what the marina is like. And I'm like, yes, it is. But, you know, people are, can be very critical of um, factual stuff. So I thought, hmm, okay, my next series, I'm going to make fictional, so I don't have to, to worry about that. And then I just enjoyed that process of creating a town, um, the next, so which was Bliss, Texas. And so it was kind of a mixture of Granberry and Glen Rose to kind of um, quaint little towns that I like. And, um, but, you know, but I got to make them my own. And so then um, Santa Sophia, Sophia named after my daughter. So um, except that Santa Sophia is spelled with an F and my daughter is with a PH. Um, and that's a Central California coastal town. So and you pointed out to me once that apparently I like water, <laughs> water towns, because that's true, except for the Bliss, Texas. Um, but yeah, so it's on the coast and it's kind of a blend of Santa Cruz or Santa Barbara and, and Capitola, you know, that um, that kind of air, general area and general vibe of just a small touristy um, coastal California town. 
And then um, let's see if I can, oh, I have, so creating Devil's Cove, I made a map, which I don't have handy, um, but I actually made a physical map of the town and it was really fun to create that and, and put all these businesses like an olive oil um, store and a wine tasting um, shop that's based on, you know, that features the wine from a, a local winery. Um, what else? A chocolate shop, you know, all of these things that I got to create in my perfect ideal town. So that being said, I think I would probably choose Devil's Cove as the plate minus the murders of any of these towns um, that I would want to live just because I populated it with all of these businesses that I would love to have in my quaint little hometown. Um, so as long as there were no hurricanes and no murders, <laughs> I think I would choose Devil's Cove on the Outer Banks, which is south. I've placed south of Roanoke Island on the Outer Banks. So yeah, I, I liked that town too, even yeah. though it's not real, but I liked going there in my head. That was, that was a lot of fun to, to do that. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, that's another layer of creativity you can put in your books when you do, <laughs> excuse me, a setting from scratch like that. Yeah, I think it's fun. So what about you with your settings? Um, so I've got Dallas, Fort Worth. I've got um, my Lo Mountain Lodge series in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I love Chattanooga. That was one of our favorite vacation spots too. And we lived in um, Tennessee. We went there a couple of times. So, you know, I, I'm really having a lot of fun with the mountains right now. Whereas you have your beaches, I'm having a lot of fun with these mountain areas. You know, Chattanooga went in and then and the Blue Ridge Mountains, where, where my Mountain Lodge series is going to be set, is kind of like opposite sides of the mountain range, and one's north and one's south. But but I think I'd have to say these these either the Chattanooga one or the Mountain Lodge, and probably I'm leaning toward the Mountain Lodge right now, um, because kind of like you, I'm 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 getting to create a little more, even though it's set in um, the town of Beach Mountain, which is a real place. The lodge, you know, I'm, I'm getting to design her lodge and I'm making up a, a fictional restaurant that's, you know, on the other side of the parking lot and that's where her friend is. And um, so I'm having fun with that. And, and uh, so you don't feel like you have to be completely 100% true to the existing setting because you're adding a few things of your own. Yeah, I th I, yeah, and I've done that in my other books too. Because even in like my pawn enforcement that's set in Fort Worth, I had a fictional mall, and and people seem to be okay with that. Um, I think I maybe had one person say, "Where is where is this?" And it's like, yeah. in my head. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you can't shop there. It's just in my head." But um, you know, I was blowing places up, so it seemed like maybe it was better to um, blow up places that. Yeah, yeah. I did get a bomb at Colonial Country Club, which is a real place, and. Um, so yeah, they just kind of kind of mixed it up a little bit because sometimes there's not the perfect setting, you know. And she had a, a specific beat she you know patrols. So if there wasn't a specific place within that beat that fit the bill, you know, I would make something up. And in your um, busted series, so the first one takes place in the Raleigh Durham Triangle area, which is basically where we live now. And then each of them are, have a different setting, but all of those are real settings too. Yeah, so actually the first one is set in a in a fictional town in Texas, but yeah, the next one oh, is set the in next one. It's the yeah. second one, yeah. Yeah, another busting out. In <laughs> yeah. And the busting outs, yeah, that one's in Alabama, in, in Mobile, Alabama. But um, but yeah, so that was fun kind of you know playing with the different places that I've lived or traveled. Um, I lived in Montgomery, Alabama in third grade, and we loved Alabama. Um and, um, you know, I hope someday to get down to Orange Beach. I keep hearing wonderful uh, things about that. So that's kind of on my bucket list once, once this pandemic is over and we can actually get, get to travel again. I'd like to go down there. So you've lived in a lot of Southern places. Once in a while, your Southern accent comes out <laughs> stronger than at other times. Well, it's funny because when I was, I think during my formative, you know, learning how to speak era, we lived in, I was born in Puerto Rico on an Air Force base. And then we, we moved to the Midwest. So I lived in Indiana from the time I was like two months old until I was three. And then we lived in Nebraska from the time I was three through second grade. So usually when people meet me, they're, they, they guess that I'm from like Kansas or somewhere just based on the way I talk because it's a little bit Southern, yeah. but yet I talk too fast to be, you know, to sound real Southern. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, they, they can mix things up, but, but it was interesting. My daughter found this quiz online where you could, you could answer like 20 or 40 questions 
and it would ask you, what do you call certain things? Mm -hmm. I remember that. Riddles, it's a frying pan or whatever. And it could pinpoint almost precisely what town you were from. It was, yeah. it was kind of scary. So I forget what that was called, but if any of you are interested in that kind of thing, look for it because that it was just uncanny how it could figure out where you were from based on your language. Yeah, hmm. interesting. Okay. Um, so I am a word person, 100%. So I talked about art journaling and dabbling in that just as another form of creativity. But you are also a numbers person, which I find so fascinating because you just have this, um, this dual side, you know, dual sides of yourself, the, the word side and the number side. Um, how did, and I didn't even know this about you until I moved here that you went to law school and you're a lawyer, but then you ended up doing accounting. So I'm curious about how that happened that you went to law school, went into accounting, and then now 100% writer. Because that's just unusual, I think. Yeah, I blame the first two careers on my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think part of it was, you know, when, when I was young, I, I loved reading and I liked writing, but I would mostly write like poetry and I would call it song lyrics because that just sounded cooler than writing poetry. Although now after the inauguration and that young woman that was so fantastic, I think poetry is gonna get its due again um, and become cool. Um, you know, I think if anyone had said, do you wanna be a writer? I would have felt like, well, that's a pipe dream. That's what people who have lived exciting lives do. And, you know, I just, you know, but at that point, you know, I grew up primarily in, in Austin, Texas, because after all those, that moving around we did, we settled in Austin, Texas, and I was there for a very long time. Um, so when I was trying to figure out what to do for college, my mother said, well, you can't go wrong with a business degree. Why don't you major in accounting? So it, it, was as good as anything else, you know, because I really didn't know myself real well at that time. And I didn't really know, you know, a whole lot of options. So I majored in accounting and, and it's proven to be extremely useful. Um, even in my uh, writing career, it, it helps me keep track of my expenses and all that. Um, but I really liked my government class my senior year of high school. And I also really liked my government class. Uh, I think I had to take two of them um, for my undergraduate career. And at the time, my mother actually worked at the State Bar of Texas. Um, and she said, well, why don't you think about law school? So, so I went to law school and, um, you know, I law school was interesting. It was an interesting fit for me, but like looking back now, I realized what I enjoyed about it was that the cases were stories. You had, um, you know, a protagonist and an antagonist, you know, plaintiff and a defendant. You had conflict, you had, you know, things that happened and they ended up, you know, at odds and how is it going to work out and what are the rules that are, you know, you're supposed to supply, uh, apply to the situation. So I kind of liked the story part of it. And I also liked kind of the philosophy about, um, you know, what, what are the rules that we all agree to live by? And are these the right rules? Should the rules be this way? Um, but since I had an accounting background, when I was interviewing um, at the end of law school to get jobs, um, it just kind of was a natural fit to go into tax work. And um, tax work was actually surprisingly interesting at times. I mean, like when I started out, it was when mergers and acquisitions were huge. It was the late 80s, early 90s, and companies were, were merging all over the place. And that was interesting. But the most interesting aspects of all of that to me was that how much white collar crime I ran into, because between the accounting firms, and then I did a brief stint at the Texas Attorney General's office. It seemed like every time I turn around, I was running into some kind of white collar crime situation. The, I worked uh, under Dan Morales, who was the Attorney General, and he later got arrested for all kinds of white collar crime, tax fraud, mail fraud. Um, and this is back when the tobacco company lawsuits were going on and money was coming into the Attorney General's office from the federal government. And he was sending it out to some of his cronies law firms. And it's okay for the, the state to hire private firms to help with things. But these people he was sending this money to hadn't helped or had helped only on paper mm. very minimally. And then come to find out one of the partners I worked with when I worked at um, KPMG, which is a big accounting firm in San Diego, got swept up in the biggest tax shelter fraud case in US, US history. So and he turned state's evidence and admitted they knew they were doing the wrong thing and misadvising clients. And so that kind of just led me to this fascination with why do people do this? These are educated people who know better, you know, they know better morally, but they also know better just, 
because they know what the rules are and they shouldn't be breaking these rules. It's one thing to accidentally break a rule, but they were intentionally breaking rules knowingly. And so I kind of got fascinated with that. So that led to my first series, the, the Death and Taxes series, because you know they say, write what you know, you know, at the beginning. And, and that's what I knew was white collar crime. And I was fascinated by it. So it that's is, it is fascinating that these people think they're not going to get caught too. I mean, and I suppose that uh, many, many of them don't, but the ones that do that are so um, um, public, you just mm -hmm. think, wow, did you really think you were going to get away with that? You know? Yeah, but it's ego. I, I've decided that a lot of it is ego. They do think, they think they're, you know, kind of like the smartest men in the room about the Enron, you know, that was called what that yeah. Enron movie or whatever it was called. And I think that is people think that they're smarter, that they can outwit everybody. Well, I can tell everybody <laughs> these IRS agents that I interviewed before I wrote this series or while, while I was writing this series, you do not want to mess with them. <laughs> they were incredible. They were all very smart. They, they knew their stuff. They can all handle guns. They're, they're trained law enforcement. They have, carry weapons and, and wear bulletproof vests and all that. And what else was interesting is they were all like very physically fit. I mean, they can, they told me that was one thing um, that they could work out on the clock because they do need to be in good shape, just like other law enforcement. You never know when you might want to, you know, ha or have to chase somebody down and hurdle a file cabinet, and, you know, <laughs> grab them. But, but they were all fairly attractive too. I was like, I feel like I'm in an episode of friends in here with these people, you know? So, so it was interesting. They were all kind of type A, but in a good way, like very driven and um, very focused on their work. And I remember thinking, you know, we're in good, we're in good hands. They, you know, I can see why they brought down Bernie Madoff and some of these other people and um you know they we need more of them I think to keep people honest um but I wouldn't want to go up against them <laughs> you know, so. never have to <laughs> yeah. yeah fingers crossed yeah right. <laughs> on my paperwork I've got <laughs> stacks and stacks and stacks and stuff huh that's so interesting well you make me feel super uneducated <laughs> oh gosh you've done some cool stuff teaching is awesome and it's such a way to influence the world, you know, and to bring the love of words to people. That's, that's amazing. So, okay. So we're kind of circling back now with, with the question I just drew. So you've recently launched your book magic series and it's a very unique series that is um, an engaging blend of mystery and adventure and family saga with a bit of magic in it um, and that the books communicate with Pippin. So your dressmaking series also had some magic. So have you personally had any magical experiences and do you enjoy adding a bit of fantasy to your otherwise reality-based series? Uh, you guys hear my dog, that's Dobby barking in case you hear that, I don't know why. <laughs> um, I Well, no, I have not had any magical experiences and I do not like horror movies um, that often have that sort of um, supernatural element um, but I enjoy putting those things into my books but not in a very in a dark way I do have a couple of romantic suspenses that aren't really supernatural but they they are based on Mexican legends and so they sort of have this um, underlying supernatural component I guess um, but the magical dressmaking and even in the bread shop because Olaya sort of has this similar to Harlow in the dressmaking um, series Olaya who runs the bread shop it's used to eat in is her bread shop um, she sort of has the ability to put into bread herbs and different things that can positively impact people that eat the bread um, so you know it even has that little thread and then uh, in the book magic series which I love because of this um, bibliomancy which is basically you, know, you take a book and you set it on its spine and you let it assuming it has a broken spine you let it fall open and then wherever you focus on the page is supposed to foretell something in the past or the future um stitchomancy is actually using any book bibliomancy is using a religious text and so kind of have blended those two in terms of saying it's bibliomancy um but i just thought that that is such an interesting divination um, and I wish it were real like I wish I could pop open a book and it would answer some question for me or help guide me in some way um, and it really did help Pippin in the first book resolve some things that had happened with her father um, so I, I guess I just like the little thread of magic in my books because it's to me it's just um I don't know a little bit interesting a little bit uplifting a little bit um magical 
don't know, it gives that magicalness <laughs> to the series, to the books. Well, it's interesting too, because I don't know if you've had this experience, probably a lot of readers have, but sometimes, you know, you'll be going through something personally and you'll be reading a book and something you read, you're like, Ooh, that was a message from the beyond. <laughs> yeah. Tell me not to worry about this, or this is the decision I should make, or you know something like that. You know, or, or you know sometimes I even feel that way. Like driving down the road, I'll see a sign or something, and I'm like, ooh, that's telling me. <laughs> yeah, that's like the law of attraction, right? Kind of the same idea that you, you know whatever you're putting out there, you're gonna get the answer back or something back in return. Yeah, and which I think is a real thing. Yeah. And I, and I think that's fascinating in the books. And that's what, I, you know, your reviews and everything, the readers are saying, that's what they love, you know, that, that fantasy element of that. that that's yeah. Safe. Yeah. People really respond to it. I mean, I think there are some people that absolutely don't, don't like that magical element in books, but um, I would say at least from the comments that I've gotten in the reviews that that is a thread that people tend to enjoy because it's not overdone. It's not like the whole thing is magical and becomes fantasy. It's just this little thread that gives it that little something special. Yeah. And, I, and that's what I like about it. Cause it's not, it's not a lot of work to understand the world. It's yeah. It's kind of this one, one thing, but otherwise the rest of the world is something that's easy to visualize and to understand. And, um, right. So, so suspend your disbelief in that one. Well, in the fact that murders happen all over in these towns and that one little thread of magic, <laughs> and then you're good to go. <laughs> okay. Um, so Name your heroines, and I would like to know how each of them is influenced by you. Like, what little part of you did you put into each of these heroines that you have, your sleuths? Okay. So my first one in my Death in Texas series was Tara Holloway, and I got her name because, of course, Tara is the ultimate quintessential Southern name. Her last name, Holloway, actually comes from a coach that I had in, in um, junior high, Coach Holloway. And I, I've since tracked him down and told him, I named my <laughs> character oh, after you. That's awesome. He um, um, was very nice to me. He was, he was, you know, typical kind of tough guy coach and stuff. But um, my sister and I had this situation where some of the tough girls got crosswise. It's like kind of a long story because of a friend my sister had that, things went wrong and my mom told my sister she could no longer hang around with this girl and so this girl told these tough girls that my sister and I had said all these horrible things about them which we didn't even really hardly know who they were so it got into this shoving match after school one day and of course I was terrified and we ended up you know getting called to the principal's office you know somebody came out and, and you know kind of broke it up thank god because I, you know, I wouldn't have known how to defend myself you know um but so the coach came and a lot of these girls were in my PE class, unfortunately, so which made it incredibly stressful. But the coach, apparently coach Holloway found out what was going on. And he came over to me one day and he said, if those girls give you any trouble, you let me know. And I was like, my hero, <laughs> you know? that was the most stressful class of my day going in there with all these tough girls and, and just feeling like someone had my back, even though luckily I never needed it. They got over it pretty quick. They got into trouble with something else and moved on, you know, yeah. as, as those kind of girls will, but um, just knowing he had my back and that was, you know, it's funny. And he didn't even really remember it. And, you know, that shows what kind of a great guy he was. And, and, and also that that's a lesson in kind of how we don't know how an act of kindness is going to reverberate and stick with somebody, you know, I'm, so I'm trying to walk across my computer here. Um, but that meant a lot to me, you know, um, at the time. And, and, and that's why I named her after him. Then in my paw enforcement series, uh, my main character is Megan Luz. It's so I kind of tied into my um, Irish heritage there with, with the Megan, but I also wanted to give her kind of a little more um, flavor. And, and Texas, of course, is home to a lot of um, Latinas. So I made her half Irish, half Latina. And so her last name is Luz, which means light because she's very bright. So there's kind of a, you know, uh, play on words there with that. And then the dog is Bridget because when I initially visualized her, she had a little bit of Belgian shepherd in her. And so I looked up Belgian names and Bridget was a, a Belgian name. Oh, and how Tara's like me because, you know, the financial stuff. Um, Tara's way tougher than I am though and knows how to handle a gun, which I don't. Um, but she's got that, that financial aspect and that fascination with white collar crime. Um, Megan is like me in that, you know, um, she, loves Bridget. Their, their relationship means a lot to her and they're extremely close. 
Um, she has a sense of justice and wanting the world to be more just. And that's something that, you know, when I hear about injustices that happen, they bother me. That's something that, you know, I think that's part of why I wanted to go to law school was to maybe make the world a better place. And when I did practice law, um, I liked when I could, could get justice for somebody, you know, if a company, you know, I usually did businessy related stuff. I wasn't doing, you know, criminal, but if, you know, a big company had screwed somebody over on their bill or something and I could get it sorted out, I felt like, ha, you know, <laughs> we, 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 man, you know, so we, we share that. Then in um, my house flipper series, the main character is uh, Whitney Whitaker. She is a carpenter and um, she, she likes housing projects, of course. And that's something that I like, even though I haven't done a lot of them lately, but I love like painting. We've done some painting in the house we're in now. Um, I wish I was more talented at house stuff because I, I do find it really interesting, but I'm just not strong. I can't lift things, you know, but, but I find that I would, I would love to be her and be able to do more of that kind of um, thing. So we share a love of home, you know, home always has meant something to me. I was never one of those girls that dreamed about, oh, my wedding day, but I always thought about, well, what kind of house will I live in? What will it look like? And, and that kind of thing. Um, and then in my busted series, um, these, these female motorcycle cops, they're all, you know, tough on the outside, but kind of gooey on the inside, you know, where they're, they, you know, are fighting to try to do the right things, but they're actually very caring people. Um, I'd like to think that I'm a caring person too. So I, I feel like that's something I have in common with them, but, um, but I don't know how to ride a motorcycle or any of that. So it's kind of fun to get to get to pretend to be a biker chick when I write those books. So Yeah, so you're a 100% caring person. Um, but yeah, I think it's fun. So they embody things about you, but also you put into them things that you admire or would like to be yeah. like, right? I, I, I'm the same with my characters. And I think that's one of the fun things about writing is we get to make these, these people what we want them to be and kind of and as an extension of ourselves in a lot of ways. I, I always think of writing these characters. It's almost like, you know, when you're young and you play with dolls, like, like I played with Barbies a lot longer than most girls, you know, most girls have put them away by them, but I loved doing that. And I think what I was really doing was, was acting out stories. You know, she would have a different character, you know, every time and a different backstory and a different plot. Now, you're on a life-size Barbie now, don't you? <laughs> That's right, yeah. The, Myrtle. The Myrtle. The Myrtle. Um, so yeah, so I think you know writing these books is kind of like getting to play with those dolls. It's getting to make up the stories and and you know entertain ourselves that way. So yeah, that's it. It is like it is like an extension of ourselves. That's a good way to put it. So okay, so uh, here is my final question in my hat for you. So okay, so how in the world did someone with a gluten sensitivity end up writing a bread shop series? Is doing it like facing your demons? And if you could only eat one of the breads from your stories, which would it be? Oh, okay. So, um, two of my kids have celiac disease and, uh, one was diagnosed maybe like, I don't know, seven years ago. And the other one, 13 years ago, something like that. Um, so it's been a long time. So, um, when they were first diagnosed, when the oldest one was first diagnosed, there was no, um, there were no gluten-free products on the shelves. There were no gluten-free blends. There were like two cookbooks, which I got, um, since, so since then I've just become very adept at baking in gluten-free, um, so much to the point that my older kids can't, they can't tell the difference. And they're like, mom, you should make a cookbook. And I'm like, yeah, but I just use other people's recipes. <laughs> um, and my daughter has a gluten sensitivity. We just don't eat it in the house. And, uh, and I, we have not been diagnosed with celiac, but we just don't do very well with it. Um, but you know, I remember <laughs> having yummy baked goods. And then, like I said, I bake, um, almost everything and it tastes just pretty much as good as I remember. Um, but yeah, how it came about was because I was talking with my editor who loved my Lola Cruz series and we were thinking about what to do. And she had always wanted to have a bread shop series that was bread specific, not just a bakery. And um, so I was like, okay, I could do that. So I wrote a proposal and she loved it. And um, that's how it started. So it was really my editor's um, idea to take this spread shop into this series. And yeah, it's just ironic that I don't actually bake. So I have to get other people to bake the recipes that are in the back just to make sure that they work. Um, and I've included a few gluten-free recipes in the backs just, you know, because, um, 
but yeah, so that's, that's sort of how that came about. So if there was one of those recipes that you oh. could only eat one, what would your favorite be, do you think? If you, hmm. that, if you haven't, haven't actually if you made them all yourself. Then maybe. Well, but I've made them in gluten-free versions. Oh, okay. um, I mean, I love French bread right from the oven with butter um, or dipped in olive oil from my olive oil shop in my fictional towns. <laughs> um, chocolate babka, though, I love. And I... I remember having that from some bakery back when we lived in Sacramento and just that was the first time I had had it and I loved it. It has this chocolate, kind of this little bit of bitter chocolate intertwined kind of in a jelly roll fashion and then it has this crumble on top and it was just so good. And then I found um, a gluten-free recipe for it. And so I've made that and it's not quite the same, but it's very delicious. So I love that. I would say that that's the first thing that comes to mind, but also popovers are my other favorite thing and they're super easy to make and they do very well gluten-free because there's very little flour in them actually and they're just light and airy and there's a gruyere and black pepper recipe in one of my books um actually I think it's the first one needed to death and that's one of my favorites I just I just love it <laughs> so I, I think those would be my, my top <laughs> they're all good <laughs> I may have to go eat a bagel after this. This is making me hungry. For okay, I I'll have to make you this popover sometime because they're yeah. super tasty. Oh, I made that, um, that caramel popcorn recipe you gave me. I made that last week and it was really good. Oh, good. It yeah. Made some of it straight out of the oven and it was real sticky. And I thought, I bet, I bet after this like cools off and dries, it's not quite as sticky, but we were like, so like, it smells good. We want to eat it. And then, but then the next day it was even better when it cooled down. Yeah. That's a recipe from my high school home ec class that we still make. It's our family recipe. <laughs> no. You a popcorn shop in your next book. Ooh, that's a good idea. I think anyone's done that. Y'all don't tell anybody that idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's a popcorn shop at the Mevin Outlets, which we just discovered, by the way. <laughs> so we'll have to go there sometime. Okay, my um, last question for you. Murder with a View just released last, this month, last month. Um, and the Moonshine Check's coming up, but you also have the Mountain Lodge series. So just like you said, I'm super productive. I am just wondering, do you ever sleep? How do you manage to juggle all these different series? And then tell us how your heroines, um, particularly in the, in the Mountain Lodge series, have evolved a little bit because she's more our age. Right, and going through things that um, people our age have gone through, and plus there's divorce and stuff like that. So, so I guess my question is again, kind of a multi question um, Do you ever sleep? How much? <laughs> and then uh, about your characters and how they've evolved as you've grown. Well, I don't sleep as much as your snoring dog. <laughs> Which is <laughs> um, three books a year is a tight schedule. Um, I did, I did, when I started out, I did two a year. Then we cranked up to three a year. And then I went back to two a year and now back up to three a year. But it's, it's, it's tight, but it's, it's manageable if I stay on task. Um, it sort of forces me to, to stay on my toes and, and, you know, but the projects are constantly leapfrogging each other. But, but it's, you know, I think, um, you know, it, it becomes a full-time job when I do three books a year. You know, when I'm doing two books a year, it feels more like a two-thirds maybe job, even though, you know, I'm constantly thinking about this stuff. Um, as far as the characters evolving, um, you know, it's fun to write these young women that are at a phase of their life where, um, you know, they're unattached and all things are possible and they have a lot of options open to them. And so I've enjoyed doing that. You know, most of my series, the women are 30-ish, you know, late 20s. But my Mountain Lodge series, my character is going to have just turned 50. And I'm 53 now. And one thing I have come to realize about middle age is that it is so much more liberating and wonderful than society would have you think. You know, I mean, we were ever led to believe, right? <laughs> yes, because now I feel like, okay, our kids are grown and launched and they turned out okay and they're self-supporting so we actually have a little bit of money now to do some things that we want to do you know and getting to kind of have that freedom again and um without you know the so much of a focus on oh i've got to meet someone and settle down and have babies and you know all those things if it's going to happen for me um there's not quite that sense of of a ticking ticking time clock <laughs> so i love that excuse me 
<laughs> I love that aspect of it. And my character, I wanted to give her that. She's kind of basically doing her second act. And I can really relate to that. And, and I'm sure you can too, because you used to be a teacher and now you're a writer full-time. And I did my, you know, businessy stuff and lawyery stuff. And now I'm a writer full-time. And getting a chance at a second act is a lot of fun. You know, to, it's, it's fun to get to explore who we are. Are we the same person now as we were then? And so in the Mountain Lodge series, my character is named Misty, which, you know, Misty Mountains. Um, she uh, has an amicable divorce from her husband. They kind of just realize, you know, hey, this has been great, um, but we're better friends than lovers. And, you know, I really want to move to the mountains. You really like the ocean. Maybe we should call it a day while, you know, we still have some time left to, to live our best lives and, and to do what we want to do. So she buys this mountain lodge and moves up to the mountains and, and she's in the middle of menopause. So it's a great place to be where it's cooler <laughs> when you have hot flashes. <laughs> And so she's, she's starting, you know, kind of starting over and, and getting, you know, a chance to, to do what she wants to do. You know, her, she just, um, the beginning of the book, she's taking her, her youngest child off to college. So she turns 50 on the same day. She takes her youngest to college and closes on this mountain lodge. So those are like, some but, monumental turning points. Yeah. But I'm, I'm really excited about writing her too, because I feel like, um, you know, when you get to be this age, you have some perspective on life and what's really important. And, um, you know, as much as I would love to have the energy I had, you know, when I was 30 and the body I had when I was 30 and all that, I would never want to go back to not knowing what I know now. So um, I love that, you know, I have a better base for making decisions and, and just that, you know, the perspective of, you know, keeping things in you know, in perspective, you know, the, kind of knowing what, what's really important, what to get worked up about and what not to get worked up about and how to handle things. Not that I have all the answers or still a lot of things I don't have answers to, but I have more answers than I did then. So it's fun to write a character that, that kind of, you know, can, can deal with those kind of things. In, in and that. I love the way you put that, 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 yeah, there's a lot of things that were great about being younger, but you wouldn't want to go back intellectually, emotionally, you know, to this place where you were, I don't know, less wise, less informed. Mm -hmm. I, it's such a great point. I hadn't really thought about it in those terms until you put it that way one time. And I was like, yeah, that's absolutely right. I would never, while there are things that I miss and things that I would love to recapture, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to trade where I'm at either. Yeah. Yeah. And Which it's is a nice thing to realize. Yeah. And one thing my, my agent said when I sent her um, the proposal is that she really liked that I captured, you know, adult, mature female relationships because the uh, Misty gets to know the woman who owns the Greasy Griddle, which is the pancake house next door, and just how they interact, you know, on a more mature level, um, too, with mm -hmm. their, their female relationships. You know, that's, that's nice, too. Um, you know, they, they can benefit each other and, and be there for each other without so much drama, you know, maybe. Yeah. And um yeah, so, I, so it's kind of fun to, to do that. I really liked, too, um, the relationship that, that Misty has with her ex-husband. I mean, I haven't read the book because it's not finished yet. I can't wait for it, though. Um, but from what you've said, <laughs> is their relationship being an amicable divorce and that they still co-parent. And, you know, that's, that's so refreshing, I think, to see that you didn't take the easy way, I think, and, you know, make this guy horrible you know this horrible ex-husband and give her that additional conflict so to me that's that is a really nice element that you're bringing into this series yeah yeah they're still a family you know yeah. I, I make that clear too they're still a family even if they're not yeah and, yeah and her kids are cool with it they're kind of like yeah you guys seem like roommates and and I think that's you know true for a lot of people you know they have a lot in common when they get together when they're young and then they raise their kids and sometimes they realize we've changed in different directions and you know there's not necessarily anything wrong with that you know and whether they decide to stay together or go separate ways is you know um, their decision to make you know I know my husband and I are not the same people that got married 30 years ago you know um, there's some things we still enjoy doing together and there's some ways we have we are more independent now you know definitely so you know, there's pluses and minuses to all this stuff, but, but it's fun to explore and to think about and, and to just write something. Yeah. That's, that's very different. Yeah. Well, I can't wait for that series to come out. I'm very excited. Yeah. Well, we've wrapped up our questions. Yeah. This was fun. Fun. 
always fun getting to chat. And I hope I hope that next year the festival can be in person so we can go. It's a beautiful area out there. I loved uh, where we stayed last time and they treated us like rock stars. It was awesome. Yeah, I hope so too. I would love to go and, and experience it for the first time. And thank you to Kathleen and the Suffolk Authors Festival for inviting us. Yeah, it's been so much fun. And thanks to all your readers who watched today. Yep, happy reading. Thank you.